ladies and gentlemen, um, good morning and welcome again. Um, glad to see many of you back. For those of you who have um, not been to any of the previous talks, I apologise. We did ask the builders next door to, and they did promise that they would stay quiet during the talks, although it obviously hasn't quite come to fruition, that request. Um, <coughs> so I'm, I hope with the uh, mics you'll be able to hear us fairly well. Um, for those of you, and there are, I know a few of you who have arrived um, at the festival for the, for the first time this morning, in addition to this exhibition, uh, there are 19 exhibitions going on at Open Studios around Holt. Uh, do pick up one of the cards on the book table in there. Um, and uh, was round. I would particularly commend the Seago exhibition, which is um, next door to the Lawns Hotel in Station Road, if you haven't already been there. Um, also, there are um, books on Benton End, um, a few of them left for sale here, Benton End Remembered, which is um, a very good uh, assembly of recollections of people who were there uh, and it's for sale for £25. Uh, newly issued, I might add, um, it's a new reprint, it having gone out of print and was recently on Amazon before this reprint on Amazon at £600, so £25 sounds quite a good deal really. Anyway, um, I'm very pleased to introduce to you, and I'm not going to say much about it because I'm, she's here to tell you all about herself and what she's up to and the, yes, that sort of thing. Um, but Sarah Cook uh, was um, head gardener at Sissinghurst and developed an interest in, uh, well, obviously she had an interest in plants, but developed an interest in um, the irises and things because Vita Sackville West was a friend and um, a particularly a gardening friend of Cedric Morris's and they used to swap plants and she got many of her irises from there and um, having retired as head gardener at Sissinghurst she is now keeper of the Benton End of, of the national collection of Benton End irises and attempting to recollect all those at Benton End so I'm going to leave you with her and um, I'm sure you'll enjoy it thank you thank you very much well thank you all I I'm afraid uh, poor old James had suffered on two accounts already this morning. Firstly, because this, I'm so short, he's had to bend to get himself down to speak. And secondly, because I was shaking my head about the um, Vita getting most of her irises from Cedric. But she certainly had two of his irises, which made me feel very much at home when I went to work there. Because one of them had the Benton um, prefix to it and I knew that Benton End was in Hadley and even seeing the word Benton made me feel like I belonged a bit at Sissinghurst and then I discovered a lot more about the irises but that was like my first first real sort of entrance into it except that I was born in Hadley and I did go to Benton End when I was seven I seem to remember running around the beds rather bored um, and my, but my granny was a great gardener which is probably why I'm a bit of a gardener as well it's always in the genes so my plan today really is to uh, can uh, I, I, do I have to stand absolutely still by the speaker no I've, I come and go a bit um Firstly, to tell you a little bit about his plantsmanship, his gardening, and his gardening friends, to put it a bit more into context, a bit about his gar and a bit about his gardens. And then I'm going to have a very short intermission, do a few thanks to the people, because a lot of this knowledge that I've got, if I can remember it all for you today, has actually been gleaned from f people that knew Cedric. Sadly, they're becoming less and less of them, and I'm now really regretting a lot of the questions I haven't asked them. But anyway, that's such is life. It's always f full of regrets of things you've missed out on. Um, and, and in fact, just one more regret. I used to work at Kew Gardens, and when I started the Cedric, que the Cedric Iris Quest, I got a list, found a list of the irises that used to be in the iris bed then, there when I worked there, and they're now ones that are on the missing list because it was before I know. Don't. That is, that is really. I'm sorry. I have to share all my sins with you, as, as well as some of the stuff I've learned out. So um, I'm also. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about why I'm here. Although I've done a lot of that already. I'm going to tell you a bit about Plant Heritage, which is the organisation that has really helped me make this collection because it's a serious uh, plant conservation charity. And then I'm going to do um, a little bit about the irises uh, at the end of that. So that's sort of what you can expect. Um, so really, 
Um, a little bit of an introduction. I, I, I should think you all know quite a bit about Cedric Morris, and a lot of you probably know more than I do. But I'd better really just, and in fact, if anyone wants to find out more about Cedric Morris, personally, f at the moment, I think someone is writing a... Um, Autobiography, or a biography, rather, of Cedric and Lett, and I'm really hoping that comes out soon because I can swat up a bit more. But I, I, I would recommend, I don't know how much this is going for on um, eBay at the moment, but uh, to me, this is the best sort of entrance into... Um, it was um, published for the retrospective of Cedric Morris in 1984. It was published by the Tate Gallery. It's not, I don't think, in print now, but I, I always, when I do a talk, I ask everybody to ask the Tate if they've got any copies, because one day they might do a reprint. And the other thing, that you, so you would actually have things you have to do after this talk um, for, as, a, as a punishment. And the second thing you have to do is go to the Tate and ask to see his pictures, his picture, rather, um, called Iris Seedlings. I, it very, very rarely sees the light of day, and I think at the moment they should get that back on exhibition again. So those are your two jobs. And the, your other job, actually, some of you may have stories about Benton End. It's rarely I do a talk when I don't find out something. This is no, no pressure. If you do those first two things, I should be happy. I don't have to get information at the end. And there may be people who know stuff that I get slightly wrong, please say at the end, because it's quite difficult. I don't like to read from notes. I'll have to look at them off and on as I get warmed up and then probably um, Jim's going to keep an eye on the time. I'm hoping you'll get home before midnight because there, <laughs> no, I'm hoping this won't be more than 50 minutes, don't worry. But there are so many threads to the story but I'm only really going to do the gardening and the plants bit but I have to tell you first that he was born in 18 this I do, I'm useless at born in 1889 he was um his family were sort of industrialists in Wales. Quite, they, they had a family home and they actually, his ancestors built Morristown near um, Swansea. So he was, they were wealthy, um, I suppose upper middle class, lower and lower aristocrats. And the surbit came from an ancestor who raised, a, I was told it wasn't an army, it was a battalion, I think, in the, um, for the Battle of Waterloo. Yes, so that was, I think, 1806. Anyone know the date of that? So, so that was a thank you for actually... And when all the armies, I think, or all the um, soldiers in Britain were still private, I'm not sure at that time there was a completely sort of um, public army, but that's a bit of history I don't really know. So he would have... He, being of that sort of class, they would have had a garden. I'm sure they would have had gardeners. And very often, the women of those sort of houses were really keen on gardening. And I think a bit... I mean, I'm very definitely middle, middle class. But, um, you know, my mother was a... Jim's looking and saying I shouldn't be, I shouldn't be talking about class at all. But, but, you know, my mother was a really keen gardener. And it soaks into your genes. And I think it did soak into Cedric's genes. And a lot of the other, of his other interests definitely were fostered in childhood. Things like his interest in um, uh, wildlife, nature. And so he was as interested in wildflowers, the flora and fauna of other countries. And this has all came from his childhood. And, I th and so you can sort of see where he was going in his life from an early stage. But hopefully, I'm actually not going to go through any more of his life, I don't think, at the moment. But I've, what I'm going to do is quote from Richard Morfitt, which is, I think, true. His family had a taste for gardening, which had merged brilliantly in Cedric. And I imagine he also inherited his love of animals, plants, wildlife and natural history from his family and I think looking at his pictures that must be right you wouldn't get all that would you so I'm actually going to ignore um, his early life completely because he didn't really start making his gardens until he moved to East Anglia and I'm going to ignore actually the rest of his life really other than his art so you'll have to if any of you don't know a lot about him you must find out because he was a fascinating man the great thing from his history the rest of his history his history is though he named his irises from people that he knew and that actually gives quite a good history of his life in an odd sort of a way. Al although I'm hoping, that, again, some people might know other connections or some of the other irises that I don't know who the people were. Um, so, and, I, and I'm also just going to say nothing about his art, really, except that I really, really like it. And I don't know whether I'd like it if I hadn't got to know him so well, sort of in post... 
obviously in later life for me and long after he had died but he's actually guided a lot of what I've been doing for the last 10 years I, I don't know I, I I, I think I will thank him for that at the end of the talk. At the moment, I'll just say he has completely taken over my life in a sort of strange way. I'm not sure that my husband would thank him quite as much as I do. But you'll see ways he's educated me completely accidentally, as far as I'm concerned. Um, I like his um, portraits, and I, I, I think his pictures of birds, I think, and his pictures of plants, they're almost portraits to me, and, and, and there are people in here I know who like, know a lot more about art than I do, but I think that he gets the actual character of the plant, he gets the character of the person, he gets the character of the bird. I love his picture of cormorants and a lot of the others, because my mother was a keen bird watcher, so I just think that somehow, rather than botanical art, you can actually tell what the plants were. I, and I know a lot of the irises I can't tell because they're cultivars and I don't know whether they were his or the unnamed seedlings. But, I, but nearly every pic, um, uh, flower picture to his that I've seen live, as a, as a horticulturalist, if I know the plant, I can tell instantly what the plant was. I, I, I actually want to do a few Cedric Morris plant borders based on his pictures, but Jim tells me that's naff. I think, I, I think it'd be a really great idea, but I'm not allowed to. Uh, and, and he has to put up with a lot, as you might, might know. So uh, I'm going to really dive straight into the plants. And I think I, I, here I must say that it's quite hard to sort of pick out his eye for wild plants and, um, and, uh, and cultivars because in his mind they flowed seamlessly in a garden. And I'm going to, throughout today, actually try almost make the point that I think that he was an absolutely enormous influence on gardening as it is today. I think you might think I'm over-egging it a bit, but gardeners all know each other. I know hundreds of gardeners that are working today, and they all influence me. And Cedric's garden contacts were huge. And I think um, because he was talking to all these people, they were all influencing each other. And I'll sort of talk to you a bit a bit about ways that I think he's done that. So. Um, just, he has left us a legacy of plants, a lot of which you can't see today because a lot of them are bulbs. I have bought with you, and, and they, he, because of his painterly eye, I think he saw differences in plants. So he actually introduced plants like a um, oriental poppy, you know the big ones that, yeah, sorry, I don't, it's hard to tell, some of you might be artists who don't actually know much about plants but so the oriental poppies and it, well, he had to so any chance seedling in his garden most of us i think might get seedlings and we won't notice it but i don't think anything in his garden went unnoticed because i think i think most artists actually notice everything probably if they're good and i think so he would be noticing plants on the same level as he'd be noticing everything else that he was going to put on a on a, on a canvas and then of course the skill is in knowing how to get that onto the canvas and he had both abilities in spades. Sorry I've gone completely dry again. So his plants, for instance there's a geranium called geranium sanguinium. Cedric Morris, does anybody grow that? It's available, you can, you know what, I think I've seen one or two people nodding their heads. It is available, you can get it and he found that when he was botanizing on the Gower Peninsula, so actually he would have been looking out, going out looking for wild plants, probably enjoying the countryside, saw a geranium sanguinium, which is a na native in Britain, with a slightly larger and brighter flower than what you would normally find. So he bought it back, propagated it, comes easily from cuttings, and would have bulked it up in his garden. And so, and then he would, he also was travelling a lot around the Mediterranean at a time when it was acceptable really to dig up stuff from the wild, collect seeds, dig up. I know it's terrible now, but it, I mean, people used to, well I as a child used to catch butterflies and I, I hate, but I'm, I don't know how many of you had butterfly collections, but you know, it's absolute no-no now. But life moves on, things change, people realise that, and when people were taking a few things from the wild it probably doesn't matter, now it really does because 
whole floors have been de decimated. But he would be travelling in the Mediterranean, seeing different stuff, taking, bringing cuttings back, bringing seeds back and growing them in his garden. And then sometimes a wild plant will make something slightly different in your garden. So there's a fritillaria called um, Cedric Morris, Fritillaria pyrenaica, which would have been from a collected lot he made, he would have had from somewhere, and then it came with much larger flowers, almost sort of double petals. And, and so that's one of the ways that some of the Cedric Morris plants um, came about. Then people found things growing in his garden after he died. So for instance, this is an Agapanthus, Ag Agapanthus Cedric Morris, and I don't know, it was probably a seedling he grew, he never named it, but when his garden was, was broken up, the one at Benton End was broken up after he died, um, a lot of people collected some of the best stuff in his garden and actually named it for him if it wasn't you know, a known cultivar. So if you come across a Cedric Morris plant, they might have completely different sort of provenance. They might be ones he raised and named, ones he deliberately collected, ones that were collected from his garden afterwards. And even there's a Narcissus Cedric Morris. Yes, lovely thing, quite hard to grow. Does best in pots, I think. It was found um, on the north... Um, Spanish north coast of Spain, actually up a mountainside, I think. It would have been growing really well drained and uh, in the sort of conditions we find it really hard to give. And it was collected by um, a plantsman called uh, Bernard Long and he, he, he then gave his stock. And there's a story, it, you, can, you can find out all about how he collected it and how some, a child pulled all the bulbs out and he took them all. And he gave his stock to Cedric Morris with a letter saying that he thought that it would grow better at Benton End. And then, so he, he grew it at Benton End and then Beth Chateau collected it from his garden after he died and called it Cedric Morris. So if you want to collect Cedric Morris plants, and I would suggest you collect everything but the irises because I haven't got a collection of his plants, so we need a national collection of Cedric Morris plants somewhere. So that's another job for one of you. Um, <laughs> yes, you don't get in here for nothing, you know. <laughs> and, um, but you have to be a bit wary as to, or you have to know that it's really good to know their history. So I think at this stage I'm going to thank... Yeah, it's all right, I'm coming to those ones. I, I'm not gonna run, I don't think I run out of time, don't worry. Um, I do, I, I have, if I'd done the whole lot I know about Cedric Morris, you would have been here to midnight, I promise. But fortunately I forget bits as well because the brain is going. Um, anyway, sorry, we, so, but there are a lot of plants, but you just need to know a bit about them. And at this stage, I'm going to do one thank and also say where you can learn a lot about this. I don't know, I imagine all any good libraries like the Cambridge University Library or you know big ones in London, but the RHS Library is a brilliant place for horticultural research, so firstly I must actually thank them for making me welcome. But Tony Venison, who used to be um, the garden editor of Country Life, he knew Cedric Morris, he's been incredibly helpful to me. Jim, my husband, knew, who actually also worked for the National Trust, knew Tony well before I started this quest, introduced me to him, and he's just told me loads of stories and has written a lot of it out because he's a writer. So you can find out mostly about where the plants come from, and a lot of what I'm telling you is really straight out of Tony's mouth. So thank, thanks to Tony for sharing his knowledge, and it's so important to share stuff and then to write it down so the next generation knows it. So. Um, in one of the pictures here, or two of them I think, you'll see Cotyledon orbiculari, Cedric Morris. And this is, I imagine he would have found it growing in the Mediterranean, probably quite likely growing domestically in a house on the Mediterranean, would have you know, asked for a cutting, taken cuttings, and then when it came back to Britain grew it, and it is better than the sort of species. You can also get Cotyledon orbiculari without Cedric Morris, whatever, but this has I think bigger leaves, bigger flowers, and a wonderful red edge if you'd grow it outside in the, um, in the summer, which the edge really reds up. And I think there are two pictures in there, because I had a quick sniff around before you arrived. And one of them has got the red edge, and the other has not got the red edge. So I would hazard a guess that one picture was painted in the summer when he would have stood them out of his greenhouse, and the other in the winter, but who can tell, really? And... Um, another plant that I guess came probably the same way, probably cuttings from somewhere in the Mediterranean, is this geranium, pelagonium, I beg your pardon. Pelone, pel do you want me to hold them up? No, come, 
Come and have a look at them afterwards. Pelagonium, Cedric Morris now, and I think you'll see that in some of his pictures. Quite often the white eye is a little bit more pronounced than on the plant, but this is another one that I'm trying to take cuttings of. Actually, another friend of Cedric Morris is Jenny Robinson, who's also given me some letters and stuff. She um, gave that cutting to me, and now I'm trying to get it around through plant heritage, because if you don't... So please, another thing you all have to do, if you get a plant, keep its name. Write it down in a book, write down where you put it in a garden, especially if it's a bit special, because in 20 years' time, that may not be available. And that is like part of our heritage. The genes are in there, there are plants that have got a history. Hundreds of them, not just the Cedric plants, are connected to people. So um, that is sort of quite important to try and keep your plant names. But so... And people who have done, and, and so we're trying to get that around with its name. You might, I might let you cut cuttings off it. No, not at the end. Of, there aren't enough on it. I, actually, I look to see. I, um, and then this one, actually, this, the geranium is much earlier, really. There were two flowers left on it yesterday, none now. Uh, he he travelled a heck of a lot. He went to Rhodesia, what is now. Zimbabwe, and found this, grow, found this growing in, um, I think, his hostess's garden and brought bits back with him. You, just, you actually can't, I mean, can't do this sort of thing now either from a disease point of view. But this is um, Xantodesia green goddess. So it's not called Cedric Morris, but it is one he introduced to cultivation in this country. Uh, you probably, some of you grow the um, white crowborough lilies, but this is a green one. It's not to everybody's taste, but it is even hardier than the white one if you want to grow it in your garden, and is fairly readily available. Oh, I've trodden on it. Thank you. Have I told you about the Agapanthers? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yes. I put that, away then. That's that one is, is a bit bent. So that's a quick whiz through some of his plants. I, I haven't um, actually gone through absolutely every single one of them, but as I say, you can find them out. There's are you, probably lots of you grow Eliagnus Quicksilver, wonderful foliage plant, and the history of that is slightly in dispute as whether it came from Cedric Morris's garden, whether somebody gave it to him, whether it actually was introduced by somebody else altogether, but, and it's been renamed about twice by Roy Lancaster. So plant names are not altogether that easy. easy. So that's, so his plants are having definitely, because lots of them are still growing in, everybody, in lots of people's gardens, but I think more from his influence it is really interesting to know who he knew um, in the world of botany and horticulture. And he, living at Hadley, he used to have groups of actual, actually botanical, um, wild, well, people who were looking at wildflower courses probably, run, uh, run by William Stern. Has any, I'm sure you've all got a copy of Stern's, somebody has, Stern's Botanical Latin. He actually... He actually made Latin easy for the um, gardener, but he was a very serious botanist from the Natural History Museum, and he used to take his students to see wild flora of other countries at Benton End. So, and loads of people would have gone through Benton End actually looking. And the other person who um, was a very keen bot botanist, who Cedric got to know in the 50s, was um, Andrew Chateau, Beth Chateau. I think you should pronounce it Chato, actually, but everyone seems to pronounce it Chato. But in her, from her husband was also really keen on um, finding out where wild, flowers, wild, wild plants came from and actually applying the science of where they grew, how they grew, to growing plants in your own garden, which is, of course, in a way obvious. But he and Beth and um, Cedric, to an extent, almost, I think, Cedric Morris really, if you read, um, I think it's in Dear Friend and Gardener, it's, um, or it might be in the Hortus, in one of the early Hortuses, she wrote an article, but always Beth Chateau credits Cedric Morris as being the huge influence on her garden. You won't read an article by her about gar her garden, her garden, without seeing her mention him. And she writes that she went to uh, Benton End, she was introduced to him um, by a man called Nigel Scott, who I will introduce you to a bit later, actually. And um, he just had the cheek to ring up and say, can we all come and see your garden? And of course, Cedric, being the man he was, said yes, of course. And I just digress for a moment. I have, I've, I've met loads of people who knew Cedric Morris 
personally. I've talked loads of them about him. I've forgotten nearly everything they've said. But the one thing that I've never heard anybody say is a bad word against him. I think he was incredibly friendly. He was incredibly generous with his plants. I think he could be a teensy bit... Um, N yeah, naughty with elderly women like my grandmother who asked him for plants, he might give them one to get rid of them. <laughs> and I have a story which I can't remember, fortunately, <laughs> when he did say something about a woman behind her back. But by and large, I mean, I th who wouldn't? You, you couldn't resist it, because I think people did... I think he was pretty charismatic, and I can remember, I lived in Cornwall, actually finding the artist down there rather charismatic, and I think some of us young folk were a bit annoying as well, because it was quite a... It's quite, some people have charisma and you just can't help but want to be with them. So I expect he got too much of that. But really everybody seemed to love him. And I, I talk, to him, talk about him as Cedric because actually uh, he has completely educated me. Well, nearly, uh, the school didn't do a very good job anyway. But um, So that's, so, but I think with his love of wild plants, he's integrating them into the garden and his knowing Beth Chatto, and if you think about the way that gardening is going now, and I would love to find out one day whether he had any um, contacts with the German and the Dutch gardeners, because they bought this sort of wildlife garden, but, but, said, but certainly in Britain, Beth Chatto is very, or wildflower garden, you know, using species in your garden rather than cultivars, and I think he's probably had a much more of an influence than he's actually given credit for, and knowing Vita Sattva West, and, they, uh, and his, some of his gardens have got, or Cedric's gardens have got slight, some of the elements that were of that time, but I just think it's worth giving a little bit more thought to how much influence he's actually had on gardening, um, and that, I sort of rest my case. He knew... I'd, if you are guys, I don't know if any of you grow um, cherry, um, what's it called? Cherry ingrams, the one that everyone grows. The, uh, cherry, in sorry, Jim's having a snooze, I think. <laughs> but he has heard it all before. Um, the, um, cher cherry Ingram, who was very friendly with Cedric. There's an argument about a sister, such as which of them introduced it, but we perhaps won't go there. But they used to go botanising together, and he was the man that introduced all those cherries that we'd grow now from Japan. So, um, Tai Haku, the great white cherry. Yeah, thank you. That's what the name I'm trying to get to. So another, that was another of his contacts. Um, Graham Stewart Thomas. Graham Stuart Thomas, in fact, one of the ways that Cedric kept the art school going was by selling irises and other plants. So um, Graham Stuart Thomas, I don't believe he would have paid Cedric quite the full price myself, but sorry, <laughs> I'm not as nice. I do say unpleasant things about famous people. Um, but they, he certainly had some of his roses from cuttings from Graham Stuart Thomas. I think there probably is correspondence, but I've never seen it between the two. And um, Cedric... Uh, as I say, uh, Graham Stuart Thomas ran Sunningdale Nurseries for a while and they were definitely selling Cedric's plants and there are records and uh, there is correspondence actually, I've got records or seen records of who he was selling what to. So there again, lots of his plants were getting out into um, the trade, probably without ever really him being credited with it. Um, I'll just check I haven't forgotten anybody else. Oh, garden designer La Landing Roper. Yeah, so absolutely in there and this is another job somebody here must be a really good researcher because it would be great to make a sort of map of Cedric Morris's gardening friends and his his acquaintances and actually see how f yeah this is going to be busy aren't you um so that's um that's sort of his his friends and his influences so now a little bit about his gardens and he made two gardens one at, the, uh, one at the Pound, which he... St so he moved to East Anglia in 1930. And I, so I've skipped from, 19, from 1890, 89 to 1930, really, in his life. But he moved to, the, to East Anglia, started the East Anglian School of Gardening with his partner, Lett Haynes, in 19... Sorry? School of Art. Sorry, did I say, Yeah, sorry. Um, in I think it started in 32, but he moved to East Anglia in 1930 and made a really quite substantial garden there. Um, I haven't got pictures of it, but again, you can actually, there are pictures available. There might be a picture here of the garden at the pound, but if you look at pictures, it is quite similar in ways to Benton End. There are, it had low hedges, it had um, 
sort of box hedges, a bit like there were in Benton End, the work which fill, filled with an absolute mishmash of plants, really. There are wild areas, wild meadow type of areas. There are um, herbaceous borders which look pretty um, unruly and un <laughs> unkempt. I think, um, I think they were busy. That's my excuse for doing really poor housekeeping and really poor gardening. I think they, I mean, you would, I think they were really busy and also some of us are slightly less fussy about, they like the plants, they like the end result, they're not, they don't look quite so closely. So if anyone comes to my garden, please don't. But I think, I think that was his style of gardening, definitely. Um, and I, actually it was the style in the kitchen as well because my mother did Red Cross teas there. <laughs> and uh, she said, she said that they used to have to really clean it and they were still worried they were going to give people <laughs> food poisoning. And, uh, and then latterly, another friend, Audrey Tymon, who also painted and gardened a bit for Cedric, she said that Vita Sackville West, who I, whose domestic arrangements, I think even housekeeping domestic arrangements were a weeny bit weird, she wouldn't actually stay at Benton End because she thought it was too gruesome, but stayed, but, uh, but stayed in the pub. I think the King's Head or the King's Arms, the King's whichever that is isn't in Benton End instead. So um, it's been, it has been great hearing quite a lot of these stories. It's been really good fun. So. The other way I think of getting a bit of a handle on um, what he was growing in the garden is obviously looking at the pictures because I pretty much believe that he would have been painting stuff that he in, in his pictures with things that he grew and most of even when it's you know the succulents he had a greenhouse we knew no we had a huge collection of succulents so I think probably if um, if he painted anything, sort of any of his pictures pre-1940 when he moved to Benton End, it's jolly likely they were plants that he was growing. And there are some pretty rare and difficult stuff in there. There's tigridias, which are, I think they're called the peacock flower, bulbs that are really pretty tender. Cardiocrinum giganteum, that wonderful white lily that is very, very difficult to grow successfully and pretty hard in East Anglia. And I think maybe, I can't, I'm not sure about the soil at the pound. I should have taken a soil sample the one time I was, that I went down there. But I expect I could go down, probably go down there and take a soil sample. But um, at Benton End, he would have had, which I'm going to now move on to, he would have had, um, because I know more about it, he would have had uh, sort of uh, Suffolk River gravel not the Suffolk clay that I, I gardened on. It would have been a very well-drained soil. Some of the garden is a bit sloping as well, which really helps with drainage well. So I think he would have had ideal conditions for Mediterranean bulbs, Mediterranean plants. And there's a lot more pictures uh, of the garden. He mo moving in in 1940, in the middle of the war, it was quite, um, it must have been a strange time to move house, but I think they did um, lift and divide um, a lot of the plants and take them over there. I don't know where they were planted because the bulk of the garden you can see um, actually I think it says 1944 uh, gar the garden picture of the vegetable garden here so that would have been pre-war and um, there's, an, there's another picture called garden in the war uh, at Benton End during the war I think something like that and that's full of vegetables and I think and this is why I wish I'd asked people more questions. That appears to be the same pattern in the same area as the picture that I've got down here of Benton End in 1948. And, I, and um, when I get onto the... Well, I'm just going to actually pre-do pre the iris just a tiny bit because um, I know that he started... that he was friendly with a man called Angus Wilson who was Paul Odo Cross's partner and they lived at I may have to look it up but is it Titcomb or somewhere in Wiltshire and he they were friendly and um, he um, actually he was an iris breeder and a huge iris man and that he was the man and a woman called Gwendolyn Anley who really fascinated and encouraged Cedric into the iris breeding so it started in 1933 he must have been keeping these irises um, alive he must have ta taken a lot of them to Benton End I think in one of the pictures you can actually if you blow it up enough you can see Iris is growing at the pound um, but by 1948 I think the veg garden a lot of it had either gone or moved I might be wrong on this and this is something we also need to find a bit more about but 
the the iris, the, gar the gardens is full of irises by then. So, and but they do make up pretty quickly. For in three years since the war, actually, they would have been, you know, six times the size the clumps. Um, and, and we also know that he registered a lot of his irises in 1945, so I think they had been bred and probably stabilised before the war, maybe a bit of work was going on during the Second World War, because he obviously wasn't involved in the Second World War, uh, but he was obviously also doing his bit um, by, by doing the irises. By, sorry, by growing the veg for the, for the art students. And the art school carried on during that period. Is this getting really tricky from the noise point of view? Or, or we just have to carry on anyway. So um, that is really the garden. Uh, um, the garden. So I'm just going to re-launch into the hours this big time. I've touched on when he started growing them. And I'm also going to just reiterate that most of what I know can be got from these articles by Tony, and probably a bit more out of my mind, somebody needs to write, the, I think somebody might be, but needs to write a complete gardening history, I think. Is it important to keep this stuff, or is it just if we see the pictures, have the lists, we can't know everything from the past, can we? So I don't really know how, in, I think it's good to keep the artifacts, but how much of the knowledge do you need to pass on? Thanks to absolutely everybody, to my mother, who also knew people and introduced me, particularly to Jim, who's, life has been t overtaken by Tony Venison, Audrey Tymon, is there anybody, Beth Chatto who's given me pictures as well, so I, everyone has been really helpful to me. And the other bit of advertisement before I go on the Irish has got to be for Plant Heritage. They have 700 national plant collections, obviously not many of them as interesting as mine, <laughs> but they, they are sort of single-handedly, once the Botanic Gardens stopped looking after cultivars, they're single-handedly, with the help from loads of members of the public, looking after our plant, our plant, our actual cultivated plant history. We, um, the good thing about it, that's what an organisation is, that whenever I've written to, like, Botanic Gardens, where I've got some of the irises from, they actually take you seriously. So write on Plant Heritage headed paper, and it's helped me no end. They help in the search. So they have been very useful. I'm hoping that most of you will join to keep the, to keep the organisation afloat. And but I'm, I'm, I'm hoping you will become a bit more aware of the work they do. If you have rare plants in your garden, they do have a plant guardian scheme where you can register a single plant. You don't have to... Yeah, so the plant, so the, plant the cotyledon, because it's not part of my national collection, is actually got threatened plant written on it, and it's because it's rather rare, and the plant guardian scheme is trying to keep single plants that don't fit into a collection alive. So plant heritage, well worthwhile. Jim's got a collection of really rare carnations that were... British carnations bred before 1970, and Malmaison carnations, which were actually bred in the nine, uh, 18, 19th century. So there's a, loads of other Irish breeders who need uh, homes as well, so if you'd like to see me afterwards about having a national collection, that would be great. Right, so finally, the Irises. So I've told you that he was introduced to it by a friend and also a relative. He definitely started before the war. I think some breeding was going on after the war. I think the war obviously an, um, did make a bit of a stop to it, but I know Angus Wilson was a very serious Irish breeder because a letter that I was given... You'll, you'll be pleased I haven't bought the original. <laughs> um, says here, this is, this is, he sold a lot of his irises through Orpington Nurseries, owned by a woman called Olive Murrell and her husband, Major Philip Murrell, I think it was, a, a, but more about her later. But this is a letter, and he sold her irises through her nursery. This is a letter she wrote to him in December the 28th, 1942, which is great to see how normal life was carrying on, at, at, um, as well as the war, which is, for, I was born after the war, quite tricky to sort of imagine. Angus Wilson's letter was a great shock to me, and also to the Iris fan, who, for whom I wanted one of his seedlings badly. She had seen it at one of the shows. In fact, I feel so dreadfully upset about his ploughing all his Irises in, that I have not replied for fear I say too much, get him on the raw, and he tells me to mind my own business. Three exclamation marks. As he had seven acres, yes, yeah, seven acres of Iris seedlings, Surely he could have kept the cream of them in one acre and given the rest to potatoes. I really think he must have got quite lost all proportion 
I know how difficult it was to keep sane at the beginning of the war, but it does seem to quite mad to destroy a whole lot for potatoes. If it had been a special vegetable, I could have seen it. The, the land was pretty good, and I could have seen the point of doing it. But so that is, that is, you know, and this is quite interesting. The social history, and I just want to add to this by one other interesting bit of social history that I found some of Cedric's irises growing in the Basel Botanic Garden, which meant going to a German nursery that had given the Basel Botanic Gardens their pre-1964 irises some, a pre, yeah, in about 1964, and they then grow all the old ones. I went to this nursery, the Gräfin von Zeppelin uh, nurseries. She had bought some of Cedric's irises, hence why they were in the, in the Basel Botanic Gardens, but they said she also had been iris breeding thousands of irises before the war, and she'd hidden them all up the, all up the mountains so they weren't destroyed, so the potatoes could be grown. So I think it sort of brings us all together that we all had a way around living, or do have ways around living through trial and tribulation, which is good. Um, so he was breeding from about 1933, peak peak of breeding and registering the irises in the 1940s, 1950s. The last iris was registered in 1960. I think he gave up for two reasons. One was Nigel Scott, who Cedric Morris, who, sorry, Beth Chatter had introduced him to. He had gardened at um, Benton End. He'd been a great soulmate, I think, gardening-wise to Cedric, and he died, sadly, rather suddenly in 1956, I think it was. So I think the iris breeding and the gardening slightly began to decline after that stage. Um, I've had to find out all the iris names. Fortunately, he named most of them Benton something, so they're really easy to find the names. Um, I didn't bring them, but uh, 45 of these were registered with the American Iris Registration uh, Soci Iris Society, who have registers. So a lot of plants are actually, you have to register the names of different organisations. Narines are registered in Britain, daffodils are registered in, well, with the RHS, aren't they? So, and, uh, so different countries actually register the plants. So I found 40, um, 45 of them. I happened to know, because we grew it at Sissinghurst, that he bred an iris called Crathy, so I knew there was some that he didn't put the Benton prefix on, so I then in, uh, came a search. Uh, I went to the RHS library to do most of this research, I, and I found they have loads of catalogues, so I have spent loads of time in the library going through plant catalogues of the period, and I found, and also I knew one, I hadn't, still hadn't found one I knew about, so I spent nearly every evening uh, and in bed at night instead of reading novels, this is, is a saint, my husband, uh, reading virtually every word in the British Irish Society yearbooks. <laughs> you have to be dedicated. And I found, I have found 90 names. So, and, so I know what I'm looking for. Because it was Jim who told me, for, before you start, start collecting something, you actually know what, you collect, know what you're looking for. I know I've only found 27-ish with, with names, good names. I'm pretty sure I've got about 10 others. But I'm never probably ever going to prove they're the right thing, so don't buy a plant without keeping the name. Because I, people have given me, oh, I had this from Benton End, or somebody, I had this from somebody who knew Cedric Morris very well, and they say they bought it from Cedric Morris. Cedric was a bit annoying, as far as I'm concerned, as well, because he also sold his also run, rands in aid of the Red Cross, or auctioned them in aid of the Red Cross. And also, he was even, well, he was, I think, really funding the, um, funding the garden school a bit with, with the irises. So he was also selling and, and also he didn't, get, so he didn't actually give away the, his named irises. To, he, very, very few people actually got one of his named irises as a gift. He would give gifts of other people's irises that he was using as his breeding stock because they, I mean, they do, once they get going, they're a nuisance. They do actually need dividing rather often, and then what do you do with it? So he gave them, I know someone who had some as wedding presents, bred by Olive Morrow, not by Cedric. So I have so many unknown flying objects in my garden. I've been given White City, which is an Olive Morrow Mar art, at least six times being told it was one of Cedric's, but fortunately I knew it. What do I do with all the ones that might be Cedric's or might not? Do we buy the field next door? Who's going to fund that? Um, have I got time to weed it? So it is, it's, it, there are, it isn't, this sort of collection is not without its interesting problems, but as, as you will have realised, actually the, what I've benefited has been massively more. Um, so, um, 
If I, and I've said earlier about the queue, I wish I'd started the collection massively early in my life because the Iris has really fell out of fashion. And they were fashionable up until about the middle of the 60s. They then fell out of fashion and they're coming back into fashion again now. Uh, so everyone buy an Iris, please, and keep them there. Um, and uh, interestingly, Beth Chatto had quite a lot of his Irises and there's quite interesting bit of correspondence in... Oh, thank goodness that noise has gone. In Dear Friend and Gardener, where... Um, Cedric, uh, sorry, Christopher Lloyd says that sh he'd got fed up with growing to, um, the bearded irises because they're so tricky and they die down and their leaves look horrible. And um, then Beth Chatto replies several letters later saying, oh yes, I used to have a lot of Cedrics and now I've only got two of them, but Tony Venison has given me two more, but, I'm, but they're not really worth the space, but they might look good in my new gravel garden. So actually... That is one of the real risks to our garden heritage is fashion. Dahlias, they went out of fashion. Sarah Raven brought them back in. So, um, and actually, when I started this collection, um, it was just after I retired, and Christopher Lloyd said, now what are you going to do with your retirement, Sarah? And I said, well, I thought I might collect Cedric Morris' eyes. He said, oh, not the sainted Sir Cedric. <laughs> <laughs> because, because, obviously, uh, because obviously Beth Chatter mentioned him an awful lot because he was such a huge influence on her. Right, the iris is quickly, have to whiz through them. He was, um, yeah, I've got five minutes. No, slow down, I've got ten minutes. Okay, I won't, I promise you I'll stop before three. Um, and also I won't introduce you to all of them because really you will forget. But the, but the brilliant thing are the ones that are named for people, I think. He took an interest in two particular kinds of iris. He did breed almost anything because seedlings can throw up. And so anything that he saw that he knew was worth um, getting have keeping and, and, and actually putting into the public eye he did he didn't only in, he didn't only um sell his main breeding lines but the two things he particularly wanted were pinks and he is credited with breeding the first ever pink iris one called edward windsor which is a rather a poor thing but but i have to have it because it's like the first ever pink iris and it's a cedric morris so that's one that wasn't a benton and but it gives you a clue to his loyalties to wales i think um, and his loyalty to the royal family, in fact. Another pink iris was named Strathmore, which is a really good one, and that was, you know, the Queen Mother's home. And he, there's a lovely record of him being introduced to the Queen Mother at Chelsea in 1948 and, and asking her if he could call it Strathmore, to which she graciously assented. So, um, and his most famous iris, in a way, is one called Benton Cordelia, and there is a picture on there, and he won the Dykes Medal in 1955, 56 with this. The Dykes Medal is like the Oscar of the iris world. It get, it's only given to one iris a year maximum, and sometimes they don't award if, if there isn't one good enough. It was a really strange and new colour break at the time, which is hence why it got the award, because I can tell you that it didn't really deserve it, because one of the most, it is lovely, I would recommend everyone grow it, because it is absolutely beautiful, but from a, a medal winning point of view, the flowers are too close together on the stem, and you just need the flowers each to be able to open in their own space for them to look really graceful, and some of the modern ones which I call miracles of modern breeding. I used to call them abhorrences, but I got told off once, so I now call them miracles of modern breeding. Uh, they would, might look good in certain situations, but not in a traditional British garden, to my eye. Um, but, but, but I think you need to see light and space between, your, between the irises up the stem. I also like to see a bit of light, and I think Cedric did as well, a bit of light and space between the standards if, if everything joins together and now the falls are supposed to be out, sort of absolutely not falling, and the, and, the, and the standards are supposed to be, the whole thing's supposed to be frilly because it's supposed to be a bit more weather resistant, which I don't get at all, and, and, they, and they breed for really weird colours, and I actually don't think it's a move forward, and I, I slightly believe that that was one of those movements was that sort of direction I, this is really sexist often. I, I might get arrested this afternoon. But I have a feeling that a lot of the breeding is done by a certain sort of man that actually has to have, make it different rather than more lovely. I'm, I'm sorry to say this, because it is... But, uh, yeah, I th and, and it's particularly actually with the Northern Plant Societies, I think, a bit where, which are very male-dominated or were. So I think us women all ought to get breeding as well. Uh, plant breeding. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. 
I knew I was going to say something that I, wished, that I really regretted. So that's, but I think he, and, and, and really interestingly, on here, there's one called Benton Farewell, which looks a bit frilly and looks a bit violent colour. It's quite a nice colour. And it was collected by the Irish Society after Cedric died in, in 1984. And I'm... And Francis Mount, who gardened for him for a while, looked at my looked at my collection and she said, "That's not a Cedric, sir. You've got that wrongly named." And I said, "Ah, oh, but it was named in 1984 by the Irish Society." And I actually suspect that it was one that the that the Irish Society saw growing in his garden after he died. It was one they admired. They didn't. They thought he might have bred it. They collected it and called it Benton Farewell. I'm not convinced it came out of one of his seed pods. I'm not convinced he was actually sowing seed pods at that stage. But anyway, that's, that's a by the by. Um, so that's, uh, anyway, Benton Cordelia and the pinks. He also bred a lot of placators, which are... Um, Have I got one there? Yeah, they're these ones with the spittledy, spittledy colouring. So you've also got um, cells which are the same top and bottom, by colours that are the same, that are... That fell over earlier on. That's fine. Oh, thank you, James. I have to hold it from the back, though, otherwise people won't see it. That's one the back. So that's a that's a um. You've got. Oh, I can't. I actually can't remember exactly what you call them. Because if they're if they're slightly different top and bottom, I don't think they're called self actually. They're exactly the same top and bottom. But there is a sort of classification. In fact. And, and it's really th uh, there is a classification. It tells you sort of, but up to nineteen. 60, the classification for colour actually only gave you a clue as to what the colour was. It, do it doesn't describe it. And you read, anyone that would like to help, you can read some Irish descriptions in here and see if you could actually paint the Irish from the description. I don't, I don't, I, you can't, you know, there are hundreds of irises with ideal descriptions and their descriptions meant to sell the iris, so they probably make it sound different and more appealing to what it was. Um, anyway, we've got Benton, there's Benton Nigel, which is the blue. So look for Benton Nigel in my book, and that was named from Nigel Scott, and that is, that also won the Award of Merit from the RHS, so, which is like his second best iris, and I think it might be his best, it's a really good doer, it's a lovely colour, it's got a wonderful edge round the bottom, round the falls, it's absolutely, I think, really beautiful, but I love them all, in fact. Um, he was really well known in the British Irish Society. He joined in 1942, I think. He was um, a vice chairman of the Irish Society for quite a long time. The Irish Society, they used to actually visit his garden on annually every year on outings. There's some quite amusing anecdotes about how the, he was really annoying because the labels were always never properly labelled and the rooks must have stolen them because one year one was called one and one year another was called the same. I have got an Irish called Benton Duff which was supposed to be named after Lady Duff Twiston, who was, I think she knew Ernest, Ernest Hemingway, I think was supposed to have based one of her, you can get it out of there, exactly the story about who she was. And uh, Benton Primrose is supposed to be Lanning Roper's second wife, Primro who was called Primrose Codrington. And uh, it's, uh, there's also one called Benton Marquetry, which I don't know why it's called that. And I've got them in my collection. They've all of them come from botanic gardens and they're all of them identical. So, have the botanic gardens get them muddled up? Did Cedric, because iris is going to look slightly different colours in different years, did Cedric sell the same iris accidentally with different names? Or, did, or was he sneakier than that? And the sort of thing I would admire the man for, actually. Did he actually, because the, our, the nurses he was selling through used to like to be exclusive, did he sell the same iris to different nurseries? Because it, it makes up really quickly and he would have had loads of stock of it. So that's something that we will never know. Um, he, but he had, he also, he did sell abroad, he sold, in, he sold stuff to South Africa, he sold to America, he sold onto the continent. He, they actually, he actually swapped pop, um, pollen with American breeders. So he was internationally well, no, well known as an Irish breeder. Um, but for, for me, as I say, really it's the stories that go with them. So this one here is Benton Anchorette. There are... Um, Supposed to be six letters from Anchoret to Cedric in the Tate um, reference in the, in the research department, wherever they re deposit these things. It, they've, um, you can get the catalogue online, so I picked out a number of things that I wanted to look at because I wanted to know who Anchoret was. Um, and it said Anchoret Child, but I couldn't find any reference to a woman called Anchoret Child. When I got there, actually, there were five letters from Anchoret 
to Cedric Morris, no surname, but two addresses. And it was a, the sixth letter was from a man called Andrew Child. So somebody obviously read it wrong and he was the child, so to speak. But I told this to somebody, so I'd love to know who Anchoret was. It sounds like a Welsh name, but actually it's Irish. And I have absolute chapter and verse on Anchoret. I've got a picture of her gravestone. She died, sadly, in 19... 45 of a riding accident and she was the daughter of um the 10th earl of carlisle so and so i you know all these irises have got names of people in themselves uh, benton judith which is one of my favorites is um a, 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 probably this is probably judith wogan who put on his first show so um who else have i got here Benton Olive, which, who's fallen down, it, uh, that is one of my favourite irises. It's one of his most different irises. You won't get another iris. He had several that have this sort of olivey coloured top. And um, this is the advert as well, of course. And, and the purpley bit to the falls. And it is really beautiful. So that is Olive Murrell, we're almost certain. I've also got some lovely pictures of Olive Murrell wearing one of those crimplin overalls, putting up a display at Chelsea. He took his irises to Chelsea quite often, uh, but, sh but the big, big nurses took them a lot. So there are a lot of records of them winning, you know, being in, in prize winning ex exhibits at Chelsea. Um, for me, because actually I'm not a very serious sort of person, in case you hadn't noticed, I, I actually like the ones he named for her pets, the, for his pets the most. And so I've got, there are, there are about, there are about three or four names for animals. I've got Benton Menace, I think was the first one I get, which is one of his cats. And I've actually got a picture that, that Audrey Tymon took of Cedric with a, holding a cat and a Cedric's head is half chopped off. But I've got the whole cat, which is great. I knew that Benton Baggage was another of the cats. It was lost. I found it after the Chelsea Flower Show. I got it from Ireland. I, I won't tell you that story because we will be here till tomorrow. Um, the one I want most, please, someone in the audience, be say they grow it or somebody somewhere find out someone who knew what it really, really looked like. The man who used to grow it died before I asked him for a really accurate description. Um, is Benton Rubeo or Rubio, spelled R-U-B-E-O. In here it's spelled with an I and it's his, it was his McCaw. McCaw. Uh, I don't know whether he would have spelled it with an I and the American Irish Society registered it with an E or who was Rubio? Was he a classical person? Anyone know? No? If you find out, please, uh, my name and address is on here. Please let me know. Um, so I don't know. I may have the McCaw in my... Um, collection I may not I suspect I have but I'll never ever be able to prove it what a shame there was there's Benton and I don't know how you pronounce this Al Sibiades and I don't know um, I've never found that Iris but it is Paul Odo Cross's dog so have I missed any of the pets out I don't think so uh, so there are a lot of other names Benton Stella which was Cedric Morris and I haven't got this Iris there's quite a lot I haven't got this was um, Elizabeth David's mother Cedric, she got, she gave them a call to Cedric because her second marriage was to the aide to something in Jamaica and she'd bought the uh, McCaw that she couldn't cope with from um, a Jamaican sailor, bought it home, gave it to Cedric, who actually really loved animals and, and really, I mean, would have kept, kept it happily. I think it lived for years, but if anyone knows when the McCaw died, I'd be quite interested to find out. And I'm going to now finish the Iris. Oh, have I not mentioned all of them? Ah, oh, yes, the picture. So, people want to know, and I'd love to know whether he painted uh, Iris in his pictures. I am almost certain every single Iris in that picture are ones he bred. He, um, Benton Judith, Benton Cordelia, I think one's Benton Hadley, but I'm not sure whether that's in my collection or not. Uh, I can't see that one, but not, never mind. I'm not sure, but it is called Several Inventions. And I think they are Iris as he, invent, he invented himself. I think Iris seedlings in the Tate is what it says on the can. They are seedlings that he thought would make a nice picture. And then I know that Benton Olive is in a picture. Well, it looks really like Olive in one called Heralding. I've never seen it live, the picture. So it's a bit harder to tell from a tiny little reproduction. So I think you can't be sure from his pictures whether it's one of his Irises or another red one, one he didn't name. So they're not a very good source of information. If anyone visited um, Benton End and took colour pictures and wrote the names down, I will probably personally try and get you a CBE. Um, but again, as I said, so I want to end on a very topical note. Uh, it's partly, I really want to thank Cedric for actually introducing me to all these people, wonderful people, really kind people that helped me, to all the artists 
all the people he named the irises for. I've just had an absolute ball. I'm, I actually quite like doing research. I'm afraid I'll never write it up because I was like that at school. I did the work to find out to write the essays and then I couldn't be bothered to write the essay, so I failed rather dismally. You know, when you know it, what's the point of writing it down? <laughs> but I think there might be point. Um, but he's, you know, he introduced me to his portraits. I'm probably not allowed to show this, but never mind. This is um, this is Cordelia Dobson, who was um, Frank Dobson, the sculptor's wife, who is Benton Cordelia, I suspect. Although he also called one called Reagan, so she, it might have been his one in his Shakespearean moment, because there's also quite another few other Shakespearean ca characters. But I want to finish with Benton Berenice because she is really topical today, because I had to read I had to read Peggy Guggenheim's. Um, autobiography because of this because uh, Cedric she put on um, Cedric uh, exhibitions she was very friendly with him he was actually downstairs when she was giving birth to her son who one of his middle names is Cedric it's quite an interesting story in here uh, but more interesting I think now is finding out about Berenice who is Berenice Abbott we suspect um, the photog American photographer and here we have um, Peggy, this is Peggy Guggenheim, had effectively launched Abbott's career, lending her 5,000 francs to buy her first camera and commissioning Abbott, commissioning Abbott um, to, to photograph her naked when pre pregnant with Peggy, a distinctly outrageous move. So, eat your heart out, Beyonce. It's all been done before. So, thanks to Cedric, thanks to everyone else who's helped me, and thank you all for sitting and listening. Well, wow, that was splendid. A few thanks. Firstly, first, well, firstly to you all for coming. Secondly, to the church, again, for this fantastic space. <clears throat> My usual gentle request for a few donations just to help us defray the expenses so we can do it all again next year. <clears throat> but the biggest thanks to the amazing Sarah and don't we all need a gym? Uh, they, but Sarah, it's been an amazing passionate speech and thank you very much and I'm sure you'd love to talk to any members of the audience who have a few questions. Thank you very much indeed.